Greetings, Tezos Nation. Welcome to another edition of Tez Talks Live. I'm Stu from the Tezos Commons. Joining me today is Retro Manny, digital artist, storyteller, and creator of the Retro Man NFT series. Retro Man, for those who might not know, is an ambitious multimedia project encompassing NFTs, an audiobook, and eventually also both a game and a film. Retro Manny is here to tell us all about his larger vision for this fascinating project and his journey realizing that vision here in the Tezos ecosystem. On today's stream, we'll be giving away three of Retro Manny's Retro Man NFTs to three of our lucky viewers. If you'd like one of those lucky viewers to be you, keep an ear out for a keyword later on during the stream. Then comment with the keyword below this video where it's posted by the at Tezos Commons account on X. Hi, Manny. Where are you right now and how is the weather? I'm in uh, sunny England. Um, not quite sunny England. Um, in Birmingham. Uh, yeah, pretty cloudy. Um, but Spring is slowly approaching. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, to get the ball rolling, can you tell us a little bit about your your personal and professional background and your journey into the exciting world of blockchain technology? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm originally a filmmaker. That's what I trained in. Um, I mean, as a child, I was obviously, like many of us, still interested in being an artist in many different respects. Um, but yeah, I trained as a filmmaker, I kind of fell into it after being a college dropout. Um, and for yeah, the last, since around 2004, I've been working as a filmmaker. Um, but I was also a teacher and I kind of got fed up of being a teacher as well. Um, I kind of had it with that industry, to be honest with you. And I then ended up having, as soon as I left the job of teaching, I thought I want to pursue filmmaking full time and being uh, kind of leading into more painting and digital work as well and animation. So I set up my own company and and left teaching. And then about a month after that, I had a heart attack. Um, Just completely hit me out of the blue. Um, And then I kind of went into... Few a good few months of depression. Um, had an operation, was on lots of meds, and it wasn't until um, I had a phone call from a friend, and I I knew I knew about NFTs at this time, but I wasn't sort of um, too embedded in that community or anything like that. I just knew it from the media, and um, yeah, a friend of mine called me and just said to me, "Why are you not in NFTs? You need to be in there." They were seeing that I've been posting some of my art work online um some of my films online and then just couldn't fathom why i wasn't doing it and i was very resistant um but luckily i got that call i sat with it for a while and um yeah next thing you know i'm kind of what three four years on now and um i'm knee deep into it (laughs) well that's a pretty intense backstory with the with the heart attack and stuff that sounds that sounds pretty awful um can you 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 mentioned that when you initially heard about NFTs, you you felt resistant to it. Can you can you tell me a little bit about that? Um, I think it's it's twofold, really. So it's, partly it's because of what we see in the media, um, and I think from what I saw, there was a lot of money attached to it. It wasn't so much. I didn't know too much about the crypto culture, but I knew you know there was millions attached to it, and I didn't identify that level of money with myself um and that you know that's kind of my own issues um but at the same time i'm very resistant to new things so when i've made my mind up so i'd already decided um you know when i'd left teaching this is what i was going to do and i kind of had a plan of how i was going to do it um and then when everything was thrown up in the air when my friend was telling me about nfts it kind of threw my initial ideas and my outlook even outlook on the world like on its head so it took me time to come around and I, I needed time to understand it first. And it, that took a long time. Okay. And eventually, eventually you did come around to the concept and, and decide to get involved. And now that you have, how would you describe what you're working on with, with Retro Man? Like what exactly is this project all about? So uh, Retro Man is an, a concept that came out of being in NFTs and being on um, on Tezos. I um, 
initially came in with a, um, some digital artworks that I created, the first collection, very cyberpunk um, throwback to the um, retro wave 80s culture. Um, and from then I was just finding myself. I was meeting new people and trying new things out. And I was doing a lot of digital paintings. But the, I, the, the problem I was seeing as AI was growing at the time and becoming more popular is it was looking a lot like the digital paintings that I was doing. And it kind of threw a lot of things up in the air for me and made me question the value of what I was doing and whether I kind of belonged in that future. Um, and then I started realizing, you know, I'm a filmmaker and I'm not re I don't really see myself as an artist. If I'm honest with myself, I'm a storyteller. And so I started to really hone in on that idea. Okay, I need to take some stories that I've got and bring those to the blockchain because they're going to outlast any style of art, any medium of art. It's the narrative. Um, and so Retroman kind of came out of that. Um, it was also, my name's Retro Manny on um, my aliases and in Twitter spaces at the time, people were only saying the, the bit of the name they could see, which was Retro Man. <laughs> it kind of fell into place. Okay. Um, like I... I understand sort of the the impetus with with the heart attack and deciding to enter the nft space and bring your bring your work into this space but in terms of retro man itself and the work itself what initially inspired you to embark on the journey to to bring this story to life um i mean again i think with all my stories they kind of have a few little seeds that I planted earlier on in my life. And then they, they just find the moment, the right moment. And then I'm like, ah, that could, this, that's, that's the moment. Um, I'd been writing a, um, my own story that it was going to be a picture book initially um, for a while. And I fully kind of figured out the world and uh, the characters and the, the motivations and things like that. But I'd only written the first kind of chapter of this of this story, which was about this young girl who um, was traveling to a new place uh, with her dad and they get stopped um, and the, the father gets killed by the, the um, these kind of guards of this, of this new city. And as um, I sort of continued to develop my artwork and developing the community um, within NFTs, that idea started creeping in more and more into the visuals that I was creating. And I could start seeing how the characters I was creating were actually appearing in the digital paintings or in the, the works that I was creating. Um, and so one day it kind of struck me that I need to turn this into something that's a tangible story. So people realize these are not just artwork with a potential story. There's an actual story. Mm. So I started with um, creating an audio book. Um, and so I just got that original, that first chapter that I wrote. Uh, my wife is helps me a lot in my film work, so she's very good at acting. So we we recorded that, and she played the voice of the character as if it was um, looking back from an adult, looking back at when she was a child. So we recorded that. I did the music to it and kind of made a, a whole production and then minted it. And that was a fairly good success in terms of people paying attention to it and buying it and listening to it and appreciating it so that's where the story started um and that's what made me say okay this is a tangible story now that i can tell that people are listening to and they understand the connection between what i'm creating and the story i'm telling so that was the moment it started okay and as i i mentioned off the top the the larger vision as i understand it for this project includes Elements from several forms of media all following the same sort of storytelling narrative, the audiobook, possibly a film, a video game, the NFTs. Um, but as far as that story goes, what was the story that you wanted to tell with Retro Man? Yeah, so the, the development from that stage of the audiobook to it being about this young girl who was trying to... Um, find her way in a new in a new city that was originally kind of based on my wife's childhood she's had a very difficult childhood growing up um, 
I still hadn't find, found my voice in, in the story, though. So she was kind of my muse in that sense. And after the heart attack, that had given me quite a lot of things to think about and try mm. to understand who I was and where I was on my journey. And, you know, it does make you question everything. It also makes you question how long you've got left in, in some senses. And that's when I think the real idea of Retro Man was born, um, before I'd even painted him was it became, well, who am I? Um, and re the whole idea of Retro Man is he's someone that's been exiled um, from his own dimension and he forgets who he is. So he's almost starting from scratch and then he's found and then he has to go on a journey to discover who he really is. And then he comes to Earth and becomes this superhero. Um, it, as, as the tagline is, it's the, um, an old school hero that the world, that the world needs. And I kind of relate that to myself in the sense of there's like a death. There's a forgetting of who I am. Mm. And there's a rediscovery of what my real potential is. And it's, it's surprising how tightly linked it is to me being an NFT artist. As banal as that might seem, it's, it is a massive turning point for me in my life. Um, and so that's really the crux of Retro Man. And it's a point where I became way more in touch with my spiritual side. Um, sort of not just getting back to roots because it's not a religious thing, but it was me trying to understand why did all this thing, these things happen to me, even mm. as a child. Um, and it was through learning more about um, spiritual concepts that I started to understand myself better. And so that's really what Retro Man is. It's a way of taking these kind of Eastern concepts and creating a, a really interesting story for a more of a Western audience, um, or maybe not even a Western audience, more of a, 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 new, a newer audience who aren't maybe so in touch with ancient um, civilizations and the idea of the ancient spiritual concepts. Um, so it's a way of bringing that to the forefront by using this whole retro 80s action hero type of um, setup. So that's that's hopefully that answers your question. It does, it does, and and it doesn't it doesn't sound banal at all. It makes it makes perfect sense to have this like traumatic, massive event in your life that causes you to reflect on things. You kind of already have this story inside of you, and you use this as the moment to feel inspired to like I need to get this story out, and this is how I'm going to do it. Right? Um, can you walk us through? how all of the different types of media that we're talking about here fit together in within the larger narrative of your project? Yeah, so like I said, it started with an audio book because that was the quickest way um, that I knew how to create high-quality production mm. um, so that people could understand what I'm trying to do and not get lost in kind of issues with the technical stuff. So it started with an audio book, and that's only going to be 10 chapters. So it's going to be finished after 10 chapters. And the, the future of how it crosses over into the whole Retro Man saga is Retro Man is also um, really inspired by my childhood, which is all about computer games. Like I grew up on video games more than anything else. And so I really want a video game to play a huge part in that at the moment. The, it's an animated series in the style of a video game. Mm. It's like you're, you know how people go onto YouTube and just watch video game playthroughs or walkthroughs. It's taking that concept and just going full force with it as an animated series. But the one thing I'm really passionate about is it making, because it makes people see it as a game and get interested in the story, I have had DMs of people saying to me, when can we play this? And in my head, I've, I've been like, well, if I knew how to develop a game, this would already be made. It would That's what would be happening rather mm. than the animated stuff. So it's about teaming up with a developer um, who can help me bring that vision to life. But that's absolutely the plan for okay. Retro Man. Um, and then from the other side of it, I am naturally a filmmaker and an animator. So the animation is already in the works. And I've been sharing little snippets every now and then, starting out as a short film but then expanding on that little bit at a time and bringing all these different elements together because 
I'm not, like I said, I'm not really an artist, a visual artist necessarily. Um, I'm a storyteller. And so whatever fits the story, I'm going to go and figure out how to do that and learn just enough so that I can bring it to life and give it to an audience in a way that I think they'll appreciate. So it started out with paintings originally, then audiobook. Now this animated series. Um, hopefully a game is the next thing um, and a film. So it's bringing all these things together because I think that's what makes it this full rounded world and not just one, maybe one dimensional thing that mm -hmm. it might be seen as if it wasn't branching out into all these different different types of ways to consume it. So these, these NFTs that are the NFTs of the storybook, the NFTs of the animations based on, based on the video, video game visuals. Um, are you using those NFTs that you're listing as a financing vehicle for the rest of the retro man project? Um, in a sense, yes. Um, I see it as two things. I see it as a yes, a way to finance the, the this concept and bring it to life and bring more elements to life. But I also see it as an interesting way to market something and get paid for it because I think it's doing both things. Um, there's actually an audience within the NFT world who want to see new art, who want to also collect it. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't that before when I started you know, putting my stuff online. There was none of that. It was just difficult to get heard. So now there's a market that exists and there's people there ready to see what you've got. Um, so I'm able to, you know, create something and put it out to the world. And so they're starting to learn about what it is that I'm creating. But at the same time, they're able to collect. So the collection is a way of not only financing whatever happens next, um, but also it's a way of them um, quote unquote, investing in it because I want that to pay off in the future for them. Not in, not financially, but um, in a way that they've invested in a story and more great things are going to come for them to be able mm. to take part in that story, whether it is being able to play a game or watch a film or get memorabilia or, you know, toys, merch, whatever it might be. So I'm really thinking that the word that continually comes to my head is global. And I know I'm only one person and I'm well aware of the reality, but there's never been these kind of opportunities before. Mm. Um, so global is my, um, my challenge. And in the world of NFTs, I mean, think about it. It's already global. I've reached more places in the world than I ever did with 20 years of making films, which is it's, it's shocking to see that kind of change. Well, as you describe it, it sounds like the, this sort of joint marketing slash fundraising effort that you've done so far has been successful to a certain extent. If you're getting feedback from people who are saying, when I can play, when can I play this? If, as you say, you're, you're reaching a global audience and getting eyeballs on your work and you, and people are talking to you about it. Um, how can people in the Tezos ecosystem support you in what you're doing, bringing this project to life? Well, there's the obvious one, like, you know, buy my art. <laughs> but um, I think really what's the most important thing to me is when people who buy the art have actually gone and watched it and paid attention to it and they're following it. Um, even if you're not able to collect it, it's knowing when people are becoming a fan of the story. And that's, mm. a, that's a two-way street. I can't just expect people to support me. I've got to create something that's as genuine and authentic to me as possible. And then I know that's what starts to build that fan base. So I think the support's a two-way street. I want to keep creating something that is going to be really exciting for people to be part of and to, you know, it, it's kind of like for me, I see it as the early days of when Spider-Man was made. That's how I'm looking at it. Mm. I want to build those kind of relationships with a, with a fan base who want to know what's coming next. Um, so I guess the biggest way anyone could support me is by going and just watching what I've created so far, at least in the RMU Gamer series or the audiobook. And if you like what you see at first glance, then pay, you know, kind of give it a bit more attention and try and follow along. And I promise you it's going to get more exciting and more enjoyable. 
where and how can people do that? There's two places. There's obviously Object, and um, there are some things minted on Taya, but those are all accessible through Object. Um, the main collection that you can look at is the RMU Gamer series, and that is um, the one that starts with. It, it actually started with a, a, a Tezpol thing. I don't know if you know much about Tezpol, but I remember Tezpol well. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't think you can know Tezos without it, can you? But um, it started with that just as kind of some enjoyment. But it, it officially, the story officially starts from what's called Stage One. And so far, there are six, uh, five stages, um, and sorry, six stages and a cutscene. So you can watch all of those on Object. They are going to come to my website as well soon. Um, there's also the audio book, which you can listen to on Object, which is under the collection Tezos Outpost 2049. So it's literally made for the Tezos blockchain. It's not going anywhere else. Um, it's going to be 10 chapters there's only six that have been released but you can listen to that on object but that's actually also easier to listen to on my website uh, retromoney.xyz that you can click on tezos outpost 2049 there and it's all streamable in a playlist so you can listen from chapter one to six and more chapters are available uh, will be available as the year goes on very cool um and what can you tell us about the reasons behind your decision to bring Retro Man to the Tezos ecosystem. What made this blockchain ecosystem appealing to you? Just going back to when I mentioned that my friend was insisting that I get into NFTs. He, I believe, was talking about ETH. Um, he didn't strictly say it, but he was talking about ETH. And the more I learned about it, and I did try minting on Polygon, and it was... And I don't know what it's like now, so no shade to Polygon anymore. But at the time, it was terrible. This was in 2022. It was a horrible experience. It was really slow. I made mistakes. Um, and jumping in to the communities uh, on ETH, at least from what I first discovered, I just wasn't getting a good feel of this is where I sit. Mm. And I was actually very close to giving up until... Um, one day I, I woke up as these things happen and just randomly got a notification saying that Object and Taya are running a space uh, on Twitter. Um, and I didn't know much about uh, Tezos at the time. I was actually thinking I was leaning a little bit towards Zora because Zora was a thing back in 2022. It's, it's big now, but it was kind of a bit more underground back then. But I jumped into this space just on inspiration, uh, intuition. And it was Wise and Merchant who were speaking. And there was a lot of people in the audience. And immediately, compared to what I'd seen in or, or heard in all those other spaces, the vibe was completely different. It mm -hmm. was way more chill. It wasn't about trying to pump anything or that we're all going to be millionaires or exclusivity or anything like that. It was just people talking about how can they use this this, these platforms to sell their art. And they were all really super nice, which I hadn't seen before. People were quite rude in, in other spaces. So that was the, uh, and I'm not saying that the, you know, everyone's perfect, but that, that moment for me was a really good one. Everyone just seemed so nice and so lovely that I thought, this is where I see myself. And straight away I started researching um, Taya and Object and then I jumped straight into Taya first and then eventually minted a collection on Object. Very cool. Um, so now that, that that moment you describe has passed and you've, you've, you've done your research and you've gotten involved, what's the experience been like so far working with Tezos technology and interacting with the people in the Tezos community? So the, the technology is awesome. Um, I, I struggle to... Um, kind of go anywhere else. I have I have kind of experimented by, I did a, a collab on Solana once, um, but I, I'm not really that interested in doing anything elsewhere because do you remember at the beginning, I felt I'm quite resistant to change in some mm. respects. And I've got so used to using, you know, my Temple wallet 
I got so used to using Object and Taya to collect. Everything connects so well. I've had no issues. And, you know, there are obviously outages or things go down, but I kind of trust it and I can feel comfortable using it. So from that end, I have no issues. And so I, I, I feel very comfortable and will continue to do that. From a community point of view, um, like any community, we people have their ups and downs. Everybody's an individual. Everyone is going towards a shared goal, but I guess there are some tensions and there always, there always will be tensions. Um, one thing I've always got to remind myself is my overall vision as well. Um, as a, a really good friend in the Tezos space called Bases, who actually used to run a space called Tezos Eve, very, very popular space back in 22. Um, he gave me some really good advice and said, you know, write down your North Star. You need a North Star. And so I wrote down and put it on my wall. And whenever I kind of start to question what I'm doing, I always look at my North Star and realize this is why I'm doing it. I want mm. to tell this story. And through this, through blockchain technology, this is the best way for me to get that story out there at the moment. Um, so I always need to go back to that and remember. But as a whole, the community has been brilliant and there's been some absolutely wonderful people who have welcomed me since the moment I got here, knowing nobody. I, I, even the, the friend who recommended me wasn't in NFTs. That's the funny thing. So I came in completely fresh, not knowing anyone. And, you know, I've met some really nice people. Um, there was a space when I first started, in fact, called... Uh, Tezos Office Space, Office, I think it was Office Space or, or Office Hours, uh, run by someone called um, Nifty. And he welcomed me so much that made me feel like part of a family. And from there, kind of branched out and got to know people over at uh, Tez Town um, and loads of other places. Sorry if I'm missing anyone out, but loads of other places that have just been staples and been here and supported people throughout. So it's that those experiences have been brilliant. Well, we, we always love hearing that. Um, this is all great stuff so far. I'm excited to learn more, but before we dive into the nitty gritty, are you ready for the world famous Tez talks lightning round? Uh, I am. Yeah. I've heard about this. <laughs> great. Just before we do that, I'd like to announce today's keyword for the three retro man NFTs we're giving away today. Today's keyword is exclamation point retro man. Enter the keyword exclamation point retro man below this video on X and Nightbot will randomly select today's winners who will announce in the comments below this video as, on X as well. Okay, now Manny, it is lightning round time. Remember, there are no wrong answers and this is just for fun so our viewers can get to know you a little bit better. Are you ready? Yeah. Cats or dogs? Cats. Pizza or sushi? Pizza. Movies or video games? Video games. <laughs> Is this real life or are we in a simulation? Simulation of real life. <laughs> <laughs> True or false, money buys happiness. False. Name one thing you absolutely want to do before you die. Is it Japan? Great answer. The last place you traveled was? I was a while ago, Italy. Long Very time nice. Yeah. Very nice. In five words or less, how would your best friend describe you? Hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I hope. And finally, what is your favorite thing to do on a rainy day? Uh, we very common over here, so have a cup of tea. That's a very, very British answer. Thank you. Very British. <laughs> Those were excellent answers. This concludes the Tez Talks Lightning Round. Let's get back into it. I was. Um, no <laughs> Pardon? That was stressful. <laughs> Now that we've introed the Retro Man universe a little bit, I'd like to zoom out and learn a bit more about your journey bringing Retro Man to life. First off, it, is this a concept that you had in your head for a long time leading up to beginning to write about it? Is this, how far back does this track? Um, Retro Man tracks back to being a kid, really. Um, when I first played you know, things like Mega Man, and read comic books, um, played Star Fox, which you probably guessed. So it dates back to then and me always being inspired to want to tell stories about 
someone and seeing myself in that in that role, I guess, of, of, of hero. I think it's what all, all little kids do. Um, but in terms of the real solid retro man concept, it came when I um, I did a piece for Tez Town, which was um, like a, a hybrid of a digital painting and an, a 3D animation. And it was about a family that had been forced to flee Earth so you see them in a, in a in a kind of a space pod and it's as if they're refugees and it's just a family and they've just got helmets on and they're in their pyjamas, essentially. Two little kids, my daughters, my wife and me at the helm flying the, flying the space pod. And I'm looking over my shoulder. The way, I, the way I painted it is I'm looking over my shoulder wearing the space helmet, but you can see my eyes and you can see my face. And when, when that was all said and done and it had been sold and all that kind of stuff was over, I really liked that picture of me and I thought, you know what, I'm going to replace my current PFP with, with this. And I took it into Photoshop and started playing around with it. And I thought, oh, this looks better if it's purple. It actually looks better if you get rid of my face and you just got this black visor. And I kept playing with it until I eventually put it out as my PFP. And then everyone calling me Retro Man made perfect sense. And it, it clicked within me that like, this is this is retro man. This is who it is, um, and he's me, but he's my alter ego. He's a better version of me um, in some senses. And so that's kind of the, the there was a key moment, and then the next real pivotal moment after that was I did a, a really my first big collaboration on Tezos on Object was with pixel artists. I'm a huge pixel art fan. And I collaborate with like some of the goats. So there's Mech Mikasso, uh, Bombadil, um, R Milk, um, Pixel Dreams, Claudia. Some uh, I can't remember all the names now, but it was a big collection. And what they essentially did was do a version of my first mints in pixel art. So my first mints were photography and, and digital paintings. And so they created um, pixel art versions of those. and I was supposed to, I, I was, um, one person dropped out and so I took over and did the last piece. And as always with me, I get really carried away with the work that I'm doing. So it might start as just a piece of pixel art and maybe a short gif. And then I thought, no, this could be, this could be a film. This could be a story. This could be all in. This could be amazing. So I just kept going and I drew the retro man um, guy as a, as a pixel art uh, piece on a motorbike, riding through the digital painting that I'd made all those years ago. And it kind of took flight from there. Um, I went, ended up doing music to it and everything. It just, I went really overboard with it. And that piece did really well. Um, it was my most collected piece um, up to that point. And that collection was my most successful collection. So that was the pivotal point for me where I said, okay, Retro Man has got legs. and he needs to continue his journey. This first piece tells a bit of his story, in a sense, but I need to continue this on now. So it was that moment that um, changed it all. Okay. And as you entered the Tezos ecosystem and you said you, you began on Tea and eventually made your way to Object, how difficult did you find it to actually mint your first NFTs and get them out there on these marketplaces? Um, so compared to Polygon, like I said, um, it was surprisingly easy. And I, it, it didn't make the process easier because I get, I, I'm seriously anxious when it comes to things like this because I realized that, okay, once this goes down, it's done. That's it. Mm. It's out there and it's, it's not just an upload. It's a, it's a blockchain thing. Um, so it was very, it filled me with a lot of anxiety, but uh, the process was very simple. Um, I think back in those days, getting all of your address right and knowing where to go and how to get your bio and your PFP and everything in there was tricky. Obviously, there was loads of people ready to help, so that was awesome. But now it's it's really simple, especially with Object. It's it's really super simple just to swap it around and and do do fun things. So I'm I'm much more at ease with it now. Uh, the process is way easier though. Um, way more streamlined. Um, I know a lot of people haven't been too happy with objects 
update, but I love it. I think it, it feels way more natural to me and I can understand the order in which I've got to put everything in. So yeah, it's, it's straightforward to answer your question. Okay. And as you, as you sort of took those first steps, it sounds like there were people in the Tezos ecosystem who provided you with guidance as you did that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Luckily, we have a social platform where we all have been hanging out for the last few years. Um, so it's inevitable the more time you spend there, you meet people. And obviously, because of spaces, you kind of gravitate to the ones that you want to keep going back to. And you're just really hanging out with your friends. I've mm. essentially got international friends. I don't just see it as Tezos community anymore. I see it as, oh, these are my friends. Mm. Um, and they're all really, really helpful. And, you know, I think the benefit of it is the way they treat me now makes me treat people hopefully the same way. And I try and be as helpful as people were to me. Mm. Um, sometimes I think back and I, I don't know how I could live up to that because honestly, there were some people who sacrificed a lot to just sit with me and help me and guide me through things and um, tell me when I was wrong as well. Um, in the nicest way. So, yeah, I think I try and pay that forward. Makes a lot of sense. Um, which which tools and platforms in the Tezos ecosystem have you found to be the most helpful with what what you're attempting to do here? Um, obviously, Object first and foremost. Um, it's been the most useful. It's it's a way of actually organizing not just the work, but my thoughts in a way that I can communicate it to people um, in, in the best way. So really objects, yeah. Um, okay. I use, in terms of other technology, I, I really only use Temple Wallet. Um, and that's come a long way. Uh, it's a lot more stable now. <laughs> and yeah, so, and then, and then obviously there's Taya. And I love, the reason I love Taya so much is not just the technology um, of the, well, not the technology, but the, the, the website, but it's actually the people that are behind it. Um, it feels, it just feels more wholesome and feels whenever I have, you know, any kind of doubts about what I'm doing. And I realize that those people are actually sacrificing a lot to keep this whole thing train moving. Um, it kind of gives me a lot of confidence. So I do, uh, I do tend to mint my most expensive pieces on Taya. Okay. Um, and they're separate from any collection. Object is great to use for collections, but I like to use Taya for the more expensive stuff. Um, and for me, it's not just about them being expensive, but I just feel happy I have knowing that my the the works that I value the most personally will will live there. Um, so yeah, those are the I don't know if that answers your question, but those are the things that I use the most. Okay. And, and as that train keeps moving, as you as you put it, how can those who are curious keep up to date on your progress? Um, you can follow me on X. Um, I'm also using Warpcast at the moment. Um, I'm quite enjoying it. I was really resistant to it and very against it, but um, I'm happy I joined now. Uh, so you can find me on Warpcast. I'm also on Instagram. I've got um, pretty decent sized following over there, and I tend to. I tend to talk more on those uh, X and Warpcast, but when you just want to see behind the scenes work of mine, just you can see it on Instagram. Mm. Um, I do do live streams on Twitter as well, so you can catch up with me there. I try to do them as many days as possible during the weekdays, and I do my work so you can watch me work. Um, and then other than that, it's my website. My website's got all the stuff you could find on me all the work that I've created, organized. Um, yeah, so that's where you can find all that stuff. And for those who decide to follow along, what's next for Retro Manny and the, the Retro Man universe? What should we look forward to seeing next? So the, the, most exci <coughs> excuse me, the most exciting thing for me at the moment is taking the... Uh, I've had a huge bunch of collectors that have come in through our, the RMU Gamer series. Uh, RMU stands for Retro Man Universe. And I've, I've been really keen on building something more for them so that whatever they've collected, they're going to get a, a more of an experience 
because of that, those collections and their ongoing collections. So I'm building a website where they can, it's kind of token gated. So if you own those pieces, then you get into the website. And there's going to be things like having a, um, a kind of say in the direction of the story, almost like choosing navigation points. So where on the star map is Retroman going to go next? Where's his next mission? Um, who can he recruit uh, into his team? Because um, they're based at, at this star base. So there'll be bits where he recruits team members and that I want the community to be part of that recruitment. So who do they choose? So making it as gamified as possible without it being physical game yet. Um, and then just seeing how much... Um, I, I also do a retro coin rewards, which is like a point system. It's not a financial thing. It's just a point system. Um, and so they can see their high scores. And those high scores will lead to um, them being able to buy physical merch from the Retro Man world as well, eventually. So they're going to be able to get in on all of that stuff when they're part of that um, site. And so it's just a way of rewarding the people who have stuck with me all this time. And they've really been collecting and buying every everything that comes out um, and really been following along with the story. So, yeah, that's, that's the most exciting thing. Very um, cool. Yeah, that's that's probably best. Um, we could go on, but we're we're running short on time here. And before we close off, I'd like to remind our viewers that we're giving away three Retro Man NFTs today. To enter, just type the keyword exclamation point Retro Man in the comments below this video on X. For those who miss out today, we remind you that there are awesome giveaways to be found frequently here on Tesux Live, so keep tuning in. If you'd like to get in touch with us, our social media contacts can be found at tezoscommons.org slash tezstalks. We'd love to hear from you. Um, Manny, thanks so much for joining us today. It's always awesome to speak to the folks bringing cool projects like Retro Man into the Tezos ecosystem and keeping Tezos at the forefront of the Web3 revolution. Is there anything else you'd like to mention before we sign off here? Well, just thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Um, enjoy speaking with you and, and thank you for listening. It's not often that you get to indulge and in <laughs> um, stuff. um so yeah appreciate appreciate what you're doing thank you we we love hearing about it and we'd love to have you back as as the project rolls on um to everyone out there in tezos land thanks for joining us on the tez talks live on tez talks live i'm Stu from the tezos commons and our awesome guest has been retro manny creator of retro man now let's go get retro